Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Tracy, you know, there is medical research, and then there is truly exciting medical research. And what we're about to talk about is surely in that exciting category. Mayo Clinic researchers have made a fascinating breakthrough in the treatment of spinal cord injuries. Now, through electrical stimulation on the spinal cord and a lot of intense physical therapy, a previously paralyzed patient was able to move his paralyzed legs, was able to stand up and make step-like movements for the first time in three years. How exciting (laughs) is that? That is a big deal. (laughs) Here to discuss this exciting advancement and what is on the horizon are principal investigators Dr. Christian Zhao and Dr. Kendall Lee. Dr. Zhao is director of Mayo Clinic's Assistive and Restorative Technology Laboratory, and Dr. Lee is the director of Mayo Clinic's Neural Engineering Laboratory. Welcome, both of you, to the program. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Mm-hmm. Dr. Lee, Dr. Zhao, it sounds like you two have accomplished what people have been trying to do for decades and what Superman was hoping for. <laughs> True? Well, um, well, let me say that this is a replication study that was performed by, the, um, by Dr. Reggie Egerton and um, Dr. Susie Hakema at University of Louisville. Mm-hmm. Um, as part of this study, we teamed up with Dr. Reggie Egerton at UCLA to one, to replicate the findings, which is, in, and, and the question was, in paralyzed patients with spinal cord injury, is it possible to get volitional control back w- after epidural stimulation? So that was one of the goals. Volitional, meaning if you say, I want to move my leg, you can move your leg. Exactly right. So in these patients, because their spinal cord is severed, the information from the brain cannot go to the spinal cord and, of course, to the muscles to move the legs. And in this particular patient who had a T6 motor and sensory complete spinal cord injury, and what I mean by motor and complete, uh, and sensory complete is that there is absolutely no movement below the level of the lesion, and there was no sensation below, in this case, thoracic level six. All right, but so that's up in the up in the chest, pretty that, high up that, in the that's chest, right, exactly. below the neck, but and above the lumbar spine. So that's somewhere that's in between there. Yes, that's and exactly you, and right. And if you have a, a lesion at that level, you lose a lot, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, um, not only do they lose the control of the legs but they also lose bowel, bladder, and sexual function as well. Now, here's a pretty simple question. Why can't you just sew the spinal cord back together if it's severed? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you know, the reason, a- as a neurosurgeon, we, we do operate on the spinal cord, and you can sew the spinal cord back, but the problem is the wiring, the axons, that goes from the brain down to, through the spinal cord into the muscles, well, it is not possible to sew those back together. Yeah, and they won't grow back together. And no they will not no grow back what together. You do. And they're like That's a bunch right. of, the axons are like a bunch of little wires that go out to the, the muscles to yes, make exactly the move. Yes, exactly right. Okay, so you, someone ha- had done a similar study before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and tell us what's involved. What actually did you do to make the spinal cord somewhat work? Well, maybe I can have Dr. Zhao talk about the preoperative um, physical therapy. Sure. Um, which we'll talk about, and then there's the surgical part, and then the post-operative physical therapy. Dr. So Zell? there was a lot of work that went in before the surgery happened? Exactly. So really, um, one of the things we wanted to replicate from the previous study was their rehab intervention. So for 22 weeks, the patient um, subject come, came in and received kind of a standardized protocol where they did stepping on a treadmill, they did some sideline mat work, and also some overground and standing work. So it's a very um, systematic protocol, it's very rigorous, and really the point of that early rehab was to determine whether the subject would recover function um, with just rehab alone. So could they recover any volitional movement without the surgical intervention? Is it because if the nerve has been damaged, your muscles forget what they're supposed to do or that they just get so weak? Or why do you need to do that? Well, it's really, um, there's a lot of theories <laughs> about what's happening, and I don't think anyone's completely sure about what is happening. But there are theories that, you know, the signal is not getting from the brain all the way to the muscle. Um, but you want to recover just as much activity as you can, even above the level of the injury, so that 
when they do have surgery and post-surgery, they can hopefully recover and move quickly into that post-surgical rehab. So um, what we like to think of it is, is priming the system to get ready for surgery. Um, and in this case, the, the subject did not regain any volitional movement prior to surgery. So he did move on and, and have the surgery with Dr. Lee. So when you say he walked on the treadmill, he didn't really walk on the <laughs> treadmill, <True>. right? <laughs> right. <coughs> so the rehab intervention consists of basically four trainers who um, surround the subject. Mm -hmm. The subject is offloaded through a body weight support harness, if you will. So they're wearing um, a kind of a, a vest that holds their body weight up. Okay. And then the, the, the trainers are kind of stepping and moving the subject's legs through a walking pattern on the treadmill. Um, so that's what we call walking, but it's sure. highly assisted walking by the trainers and just trying to get um, the nervous system used to doing that again. And you wanted, to, you wanted to make sure that the, the spinal cord lesion was complete and, and the patient wouldn't get any better with any kind of rehab. Exactly. And, so you, and you figured out that he wouldn't, so then you said, Dr. Lee, help us. <laughs> yeah, so at that point, neurosurgery, our team uh, <coughs> took over and took the patient to the operating room. So the operation involves a whole surgical team uh, along with Dr. Zhao's team and Dr. Reggie Eggerson's team from UCLA. And the reason is because the surgery, we had to place the, this implantable system in a very particular area. So the patient came to the operating room, the anesthesia team intubates the patient and the patient is under general anesthesia. The patient is placed um, on the operating table with face down and exposing the back. So what we do is to make a midline incision where we go down reflecting the paraspinal muscles laterally. The muscles on the sides of the spine. Exactly. And I had to um, expose the epidural space. And when, what that means is that the spinal cord sits in the spinal canal and the covering of that uh, of the spinal cord is called the dura, which is it's this um, saran wrap. Yeah, ba yeah, basically a very tough um, mm -hmm. uh, wrap that goes around the spinal cord, sure. which encases the cerebral spinal fluid. And so the electrode has to be right above that dura, and that's why it's called epidural stimulation, meaning above the dura. Okay. So to do that, we had to remove a little bit of the the bone, what's called the lamina, which is the, the vertebral bone that covers the spinal cord, so that we can slide this uh, electrode, which is actually used for other indications. So this is a system that is made by uh, companies such as Medtronic that can be placed above the dura to help patients for pain. And so the mm -hmm. device itself is actually approved for pain indication. Mm -hmm. But in order for us to do this, we did have to get the FDA approval as, as well as the what's called IRB approval, Investigational uh, Review Board, that allowed us to do this very cutting edge surgery. And then once the electrode was placed and um, it is then connected to a battery that is actually placed on a second uh, part of the surgery into an area just above the abdomen. So and inside the body, though. Yes, yes. So everything is um, is um, is implanted uh, inside the body. Can't see anything. Yes. Okay. Now, 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 do you put this electrode just above the the site where the cord has been damaged, or no. in, in relationship to the the damaged cord, where do you put it? Yeah, so this is a good question. So in order for this to work, we have to put the electrode below the level of the lesion okay. in an area that um, has the spinal cord that feeds all of the leg areas. And so this is actually placed be at the T12, thoracic level 12, and L1 level, because that's approximately where the greatest nerves that go into the legs, that's where they exist. Oh, cool. so it's quite a ways below where yes. the, the actual cord damage was. Yes, that's, that's right. Okay. And furthermore, when we place this, we also have to get EMG signals from all of the different muscles that the stimulation will hope to activate. So in, in the legs, and EMG is, these are very small 
uh, probes that goes into the muscles. And Dr. Reggie Eggerson's team, along with Dr. Zhao's team, was monitoring all of those signals. So that after the surgical team placed this implanted system, we could see that we placed those electrodes in the correct location. Ah, interesting. So how long did that operation take? Well, you know, this took uh, quite a bit of time because of all of the testing that we had to do. And so I would say that it took about six hours mm -hmm. in total. All right, our guests are Dr. Kendall Lee. He's a neurosurgeon at the Mayo Clinic and director of Mayo Clinic's Neural Engineering Laboratory. And Dr. Kristen Zhao is also with us. She is director of Mayo Clinic's Assistive and Restorative Technology Laboratory. And she's also a, an assistant professor of biomedical engineering. They're here telling us about some fascinating new surgery to help paralyzed patients gain function. Time, to t time for a short break. When we come back, we'll talk more about the patient, how they're doing now, and what the future holds for uh, restoring function in paralyzed patients. You're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We're talking about electrical stimulation of the spinal cord and restoring function in patients who have had spinal cord injuries. We're with neurosurgeon Dr. Kendall Lee and a biomedical engineer Dr. Christian Zhao. So we've talked about the fact that you identified a patient who had a lesion up in the, in the chest area. Spinal cord had been completely uh, cut or damaged. Uh, you have uh, tried physical therapy, and it didn't help. You knew it wasn't going to work. So then you inserted this electrode a little lower down in the, uh, the spine. Uh, you've got a battery pack also inserted in the patient to uh, provide stimulation to the electrode. And then, Dr. Zhao, you take over after that? Well, so up immediately after surgery, the patient goes through some um, post-surgical... Um, yes, uh, so we typically wait about two surgery. weeks in order for the wounds to heal. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I should also mention that the implant, even though we call it the battery, is actually a lot more than a battery. This is a really a computer system that allows us to electrically stimulate these different contacts in a very particular way. It controls the pulse width, the amount of voltage, which contact that we can stimulate, and the frequency. And so by being able to control that, we can program this device into a very particular neuromodulation therapy. Well, and do you program it, Dr. Zhao, or um, how does so that So our, team, our uh. team of engineers from both the neural engineering side and the rehab side have learned to program this device. And early on, um, we call that optimization. So wh what are the best combinations of stimulation that will help the patient? Although um, we think that over time, we will continue to sort of optimize this for the subject. Um, and that's one of our future. That you can adjust right. what is happening with that stimulator? Right. Yes. OK. And, and what did you want to happen? What was the first thing you tried? Well, you know, I, I have to say, one of our expectations was that it would take a long stimulation period mm -hmm. and long amount of post-operative physical therapy before we would get any volitional movement back. The, one of the great surprises with this study, which has not been described before, is that this patient was able to get volitional control back the first time we turned them on, which was really spectacular. And you were expecting weeks. That, that's right. Wow. In fact, the first right. few times we were, ex wow. yeah. <laughs> we, we were expecting nothing. Right. And, and the biggest <laughs> okay. surprise was that the first day we turn, turned this on and we asked him to move his legs, he did it. Hmm. And, and what you were saying earlier, the volitional is very important, that this was not just a muscle twitch, but this was him controlling his leg muscles once again. You s so you said to him, can you move your leg? and yes. he moved his leg. Right, so first we, we try it with the stimulator off and we say, you know, try to move your leg, try to flex your knee, try to move your ankle, and there's no response. Then when we turn the stimulator on, we say the same thing and there's a response. So it's clear that you know, it was the first time for him to see that movement, I think he was surprised, but we had started with the stimulator off and he couldn't. So how exciting on. was that? I mean, was the whole team there? It was, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I can speak for myself personally. Uh, it was really mind-blowing. Really? You know, uh, you, you've you done this one patient, and that was how long ago? And, and what's the status of the patient now? How's he doing? 
So the subject is still enrolled in the study. Um, he's continuing to do um, three rehab sessions a week, and we continue to push him to try and regain additional function. So um, we, we hope to have another report um, out in July with some, some additional findings. Yeah, um, I can say that because the findings of the first two weeks of stimulation was so exciting and novel, uh, we did write up our findings, and it was published in Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what can he do now? I mean, in terms of, of function, can he walk? Can he take some steps? Uh, wh where, well, where I think he? we need to be a little bit careful yeah. with answering this because <laughs> we, we, uh, the patient is still under clinical IRB. study mm -hmm. and under IRB, um, unfortunately. You're not talking is what you're saying. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we're, we are um, we're optim uh, very optimistic and we're still collecting that information. And so we want to collect the information properly and release the information appropriately as well. Well, at the beginning of the interview, Dr. Shives said uh, something about Superman and Christopher Reeve, of course, uh, his spinal cord was severed. He died. Uh, it's been over 10 years. We looked to see how long it had been, 13 years. But that's what this, his foundation, that's what they, th there had to be issues. people on that foundation that were very excited with what you've accomplished to this point too. Yes, and I think what is really exciting about this is that it also changes our paradigm in thinking about spinal cord injury. You know, I can tell you when I went through medical school and training, and as a neurosurgeon seeing these patients in clinic and the emergency rooms that once you have the complete spinal cord injury, you're not going to get volitional control back. Sure. But this, I think, changes that whole paradigm thinking. So how many uh, patients in this country could potentially benefit from this new research? I mean, how many paralyzed people are there in, in this country? Well, I don't know the answer to that. It was I'm hundreds sorry. of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Yeah. So Worldwide, I think it's, it's... Number in the millions. Millions, millions. Yes. So, Okay, few, so you've done one. Mm -hmm. um, when are you going to do the next one? And, and how many people <laughs> have written you, emailed you, called you, and said, I want to be next? Yeah, you know, after we published our first paper, there has been a tremendous uh, response mm -hmm. from the public. What I will say is this technology, though, is still early stage. And mm -hmm. so, yes, um, I, I do think that we can be optimistic, but I think we also need to be very cautious. This is very few patients who underwent this study. We still do not understand the mechanism, how we're doing this, and therefore those studies need to be done. And I think we need to uh, move forward very cautiously, but optimistically. So do you believe that someday uh, being paralyzed will not be a permanent condition? Do you think that someday some... So, I mean, I think one of the next steps we, we really need to address is identifying which patients are ideal candidates for this you know who will respond to this and who won't I mean obviously every spinal cord injury is a little bit different depending on the mechanism and we really need to get some some evidence and some data to say you know these are the patients we think we can help and we're confident we can help and these are the ones we can't or in, in through research studies so I mean I think speak for both of us that that's really the next step is to really try and, and, and understand that mechanism. Do you think it makes yeah. a difference how long it's been since the cord was injured? I mean, do you have, is it more likely that you can well, help somebody who had it? Well, I think this is an excellent question, but um, it we is don't know yet the answer unknown, yet. yes. All right, electrical stimulation for restoring functions I function in patients with spinal cord injuries. Dr. Kristen Zhao, biomedical engineer, neurosurgeon, Dr. Kendall Lee, thank you so much. It's thank exciting you. research and all the best in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful to be with you today. Mm -hmm.